Hello, everyone. I'm, while we we're waiting for people to stream in, you can you can put in the chat where you where you're coming from and exactly how much you love monarchs. And if it's just a little, well, this is gonna be very boring. <laughs> and no one just no one loves monarchs just a little. So our, our Missouri people, they're they're hardcore in their love for monarchs. Okay. Well, we have about a hundred people have hopped on so far, so I'll go ahead and introduce. One thousand percent. Nice. <laughs> Welcome, all of you. Someone well, loves monarchs a thousand percent. That is awesome. I love them a hundred, a one thousand and one percent. So just a little more. <laughs> yeah, Branson. <laughs> great, we've got people from all over the state. Yeah, well, hello great. everybody. Welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar. We're with author Sarah Dykeman. Uh, she's going to be talking about her new book and the adventures behind it by circling with butterflies. Uh, my name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation. And I want to thank you all for joining us. So during, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your Zoom screen. And at the end, I'll come back on and read those to Sarah. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with any links to resources mentioned in today's presentation, a link to get the book if you haven't already. Um, so to introduce today's speaker, Sarah Dykeman is the founder of beyondabook.org, which fosters lifelong learners, boundary pushers, explorers, and stewards. She works in amphibian research and is an outdoor educator, guiding young people into nature so they can delight in its complicated brilliance. She hopes her own adventures, which include walking from Mexico to Canada, canoeing the Missouri River from source to sea, and cycling over 80,000 miles across North and South America uh, will empower young and old to dream big. So today we'll be hearing about her 10,201 mile bike adventure from Mexico to Canada and back following the monarch migration. So take it away, Sarah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Brooke. And I also had a lot of help from Carol with uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation. I um, was delighted that they reached out about doing a presentation. It was the easiest presentation to set up. They just said, hey, how about this day? And I said, hey, that sounds great. And that was about it. So they've made this a smooth, painless process. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I'm from Kansas City, Kansas, or right outside of Kansas City, Kansas. I could I could throw a stone into Missouri though. And I, I love Missouri. I love all the conservation efforts. I love the community that has come around together around native plants, around the Missouri River, around taking care of the planet. It's just, it's a, it's a thrill and I'm, it's an honor to be here. And, and from the bottom of my heart, before I run out of time at the end, thank you so much. Thank you, Missouri and in and, and, and Illinois. I see an Illinois in there too. So thank, thank you a lot. Um, so I, one of the things I, I do when I bike is I make a lot of mistakes. Actually, all of my trips is a series of small misadventures where I learn along the way. And I actually gave a presentation yesterday to folks in Iowa, and I was experimenting with another way to use Zoom. And so that it's not just, I'm not just a little tiny face. And I got a little feedback that it didn't quite work, which is okay. This is how we learn. But I'm going to actually go ahead and go back to that mode and I'm going to look at the chats and I think Brooke will too and if it's not working for folks I'll go back to the to the normal way but I'm going to I'm going to first start with this unnormal way if you will so give me a sec and I'm going to share my screen oops so far so good that's a monarch oh boy oh boy here we go. <laughs> I messed things up in the in the beginning. Okay, so if this isn't working for people, that's okay. Um, just let me know in the in the chats, and and I actually will pause here in a minute or so and ask Brooke if everyone's um, freaking out because it's because I'm like squished or weird or anything. It might just be <laughs> be me, but. Anyway, why, while I wait for this feedback to come in, I will um, just let folks know um, the main thing that always, the main question people have for me. 
is why did you follow the monarchs? And for me, the answer is obvious in so many ways, but that's like with hindsight. And in the end, when I'm when I'm left to really ponder the question, I think, why am I following the monarchs? And a lot of it was just really good luck. Like I was interested in the monarchs, but amphibians were my main passion. Amphibians don't migrate very far. They, it, it wouldn't have been a very long bike ride to follow a Yosemite toad from one, one pond to the other. So I was kind of interested in the monarch and the more I learned about them, the more everything just added up to, to just like the ideal traveling companion. And the more I thought, I, I think this could be a, a good trip. And, and like Brooke said, I've done a lot of other adventures but the monarch just kept the monarch just kept saying, "No, this is the next one. This is the next one. Look at all these things that make make it perfect." And um, let's see. I'm looking at the chats. I see a, a few looks good, and it might be the browser too. And I see I'm in about there's like a third of the screen. I've seen that too. I could try and make it bigger. Um, it, you say it works for you, so I might just roll with it. Thanks for being flexible. Um, that such as technology. It's probably good if I'm a little smaller on the screen, but. Um, uh, well, Brooke, did you like want to add anything? It, it looks good here and from all the comments, it looks like it's it's working for the group here. So I think you can go ahead. Okay. And if, it, if it's not working, you can just like pretend that it's like, you're on the part of the bike ride that's uphill. So it's like a little bit harder to deal with, but there's, there'll be a downhill and it'll be over shortly. Um, but I'm going to jump back in then. Thanks to everybody for being flexible with me. And I actually am going to change things a little bit so you can see this, this map a little bit bigger for a second. And this is the, the Monarch's range. And this is one of the main reasons that I could follow the Monarch. Because if you look at this map, pretty much all of the United States has a color. So the yellow is where the Monarchs spend the summer. The green is where they spend the spring and the orange is where they spend the fall. And then these tiny blue dots are where they spend the winter. And the most of the monarchs, we call this on, on the, the Eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, the Eastern population. Most of these monarchs, the majority, overwinter in the states of Mexico and Michoacan in South Central Mexico. And this is where they cling to the branches and they have these dense clusters. And this is where you see the pictures that are mind blowing. And I looked in this and I knew I wanted to start here. And then I knew I wanted to be in this, in the green, in the spring, in the summer, uh, the yellow in the in the summer. And so, one of the things I love most about the monarchs is, is I, I compare them to clouds. They're very democratic. They go anywhere. They go to farm fields. They go to big cities. They go to suburban neighborhoods in the Midwest, in the South. Like, like if you have a garden, they will come, which is a really beautiful thing that the monarch offers us. And and because there wasn't like a tiny little stretch Their Their route wasn't just this tiny little thing. If basically, if I was on a road in one of these colors in the right time, I was on the route of the Monarch. <laughs> Someone in the comments says, looks like they, they dare not cross the Canadian border. And actually, if you look this line here, that line is where the milkweed is. So the range of the milkweed is where, where they stop going north. Um, and here is my route. And this red line took me eight and a half months, and it was a 10,201 mile route. Some people, when they interview me, they just say 10,000 miles, and I'm like, nope, nope, nope. It was 10,201 miles. Those last three miles of the trip were probably the hardest because they were straight uphill. And I started in Michoacan in, in the middle of about mid-March, and I went north following the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico into Texas, and then pretty much from Texas north and then my loop back, it was, I went where the energy was. So you can see over here, I was originally, I was gonna go from New York straight to Missouri and folks in Southern Ontario, they said, um, actually, we really think you should come here. And here's like 500 reasons why. And so I actually changed my route to go with them, to go there because one of my, one of my goals during this whole time was to kind of be a spotlight for the monarch. And so I couldn't, do all that work on my own. I couldn't, I couldn't contact the media and arrange presentations and do all that by myself. So if someone was really interested in my trip and had the energy 
to put time into doing all that hard work, then I would try and get to them to an extent. You know, sometimes it was like, okay, I'm really tired. I can't do that extra 300 miles. But in this case, I went to Southern Ontario and that's kind of where all the squiggles come from. And you'll see for Missouri, I crossed at, I crossed into Missouri around Cape Girardeau or not around at Cape Girardeau. And then I went up north. I missed a little bit of St. Louis, but I got on the Katy Trail, did a detour to Jeff City and Columbia, all the way over to Kansas City to visit my folks, which that's why I went there twice so I could get home cooking a couple times. I got home cooking a lot, but anyway, um, the only other thing I want to note before I move on is in the primer of, of butterflies is that my route I followed, um, I, I did the entire route, but the monarchs that I started with in Mexico were not the monarchs I finished with. So the migration is multi-generational and it takes about three to five generations, depending on the climate or the weather, excuse me, um, to make this entire loop. So let's see. Oops, wrong one. Okay, hopefully it's still working for everybody. Um, let's, oops. And I wanna just jump into a little primer on bike touring. So my book, in case you didn't know, is called Bicycling with Butterflies. And um, I, I did a little primer on the butterfly part and I wanna do a little primer on the bicycling part. And this is my bicycle. It is an old steel mountain bike. I describe it as a cross between a road sale and a, or a garage sale and a junkyard. It's pretty scrappy, but you don't need to have the fanciest bike in the world to go on a trip like this. In fact, a lot of times, not as expensive, not as light, not as fancy is better because they're sturdier and you can leave them in front of a grocery store to go buy whatever it is you want to buy at the grocery store without having to worry too much about someone trying to, to run off with it. And the other thing you should note for my bike is that these bags, the bags on bikes are called panniers or saddlebags often. My front ones are waterproof. They're commercially made. And I put things like my computer and my sleeping bag, like things that I really needed to make sure stayed dry. In fact, my sleeping bag was like padding for my computer, which was nice. In the back, my panniers are made from old kitty litter buckets and they cost about a dollar and a half to make each. And the outside is an old um, apron that I found at a thrift store for a server. So it has like the pockets for money and stuff. I put I put things that could get wet on the outside. And because of the setup, I had a lot of freedom. So when I set out on um, in, Metro, in Michoacan to go north, I didn't know exactly where I was going. And that was fine by me because I knew I had what I needed for the most part. And I knew things would fall in place. And I knew I would meet people and I knew the adventure would happen. And, and so having all these things on your bike really gives you a lot of freedom. And, and so that way I could, I could eat when I was hungry. And so I was constantly pulling off the road to have a snack. This is a picture of me cooking. I didn't actually cook all that much because I'm pretty lazy when it comes to food and I'm completely satisfied most nights with eating a bunch of sandwiches and you don't have to wash dishes if your plate is a piece of bread. So I, I was a pretty lazy, lazy cook on this trip especially because I was by myself. When, when I travel with other, with friends, then it's kind of like every night you, you make food. But alone, I just um, ate sandwiches. And the other great thing about biking, besides being able to eat whenever you want, is you, can, you get to stop whenever you want. So I could see some dinosaurs and I could stop. Or I could see some little um, Indian paintbrushes there that's a, a flower, and I could stop. And when you're in a car going 60 miles an hour down the, the, the highway, you might see a really cool flower. And by the time you've processed it and you've decided you wanna stop and you've found a, a safe place to go, well, you're like two miles down the road and then you're like, eh, there'll be more flowers. But on a bike, well, one, you're tired of biking and your legs hurt. So you're like, I need an excuse to stop. And you see a flower and you're like, cha-ching, perfect. And you slam on your brakes and you lay your bike down and you can get off the road safely, easily and then you get to explore. And so, so much of bike touring, the advantage is you're going slow and you're seeing everything between point A and point B, which is where real, the true adventure lies. And the other great thing about bike touring is you get to camp when you want, where you want. So this is my tent here. It's blended in, I call this type of camping, camping in plain sight. A lot of times people call it guerrilla camping or stealth camping. Um, there's, a, there's the road there and the great, advantage of this is uh, is I would say threefold. One, it's cheap. You, I never paid for camping. 
I see a, a comment or question of, did I have sponsors? On this trip, I, I didn't, it, it, I did have sponsors in, in some way because people would invite me in and I got a lot of meals and a lot of generous generous donations and things like that. But as far as companies, I, I, didn't, I didn't need them because I was probably spending five or so dollars on food a day and I wasn't paying to camp. So it's, it was a very cheap endeavor. The other great thing about this is you don't have to have a plan. You don't have to think, oh, the next, the next campsite isn't in for 70 miles, so I've got to like bust my legs all day to get to that camp spot. You can be like, well, I'm gonna go probably about 60 miles, so I'll get where I'll get, I'll see what I see, and I'll sleep when I'm tired. And the third reason I love this way of camping is, especially on this trip, was it really bonded me to the experience of the monarch. So monarchs too are, are traveling just like, like I was and, and they were going north or south or wherever and they were searching out these, these camp spots and they weren't going to hotels. They were, they were relying on finding what they needed when they arrived wherever it was. And so I have to imagine there were times when the monarch would find the perfect camp spot. And for me, perfect camp spot was flat, easy to get to, um, like, like, beautiful, but in a little secluded. And then also there was, a, there'd be a tree for me to prop my bike up. That was like the perfect, perfect campsite. And for the monarch, it's probably a little shelter, some, some native nectar plants for food, maybe a little water, maybe um, some milkweed to lay their eggs. And so I also know that the monarch probably had those days where they couldn't find those things. And it was a lot of pavement, a lot of green grass. And it was probably kind of stressful for them. And it certainly was stressful for me a few nights when I couldn't find what I needed. And so I really, I really connected to the monarch and I connected to the experience of relying on, on people, on strangers to manage the land and to invite, invite me to their house or their yard, just like the monarchs do. Um, now I get to that part of the presentation and people are like, nope, I do not wanna camp on the side of the road, but here is the main and most best, most best, the best reason to um, do this type of bike touring, cleaning your house is so easy. All you have to do, lift it up, shake it out, and yeah, you have got a clean house. The other great thing about this way of traveling is because you're going slow, because you're often between tourist destinations, people are really interested in your trip and people will stop all the time, including places like Mexico, um, where I was on the side of the road, or I was biking down the side of the road in, in Mexico, it was super hot, I was like, you know, just trying trying to get somewhere, honestly, because it was a big highway. And this motorcyclist stops, and I'm like, "Oh, great! Here we go. What does this guy want?" And he's like, "You want some ice cream?" And I'm like, "Of course, I want ice cream." And one of my rules with bike touring is always say yes if you feel safe. And by not having a really concrete plan from point A to point B, I was able to take advantage of these opportunities. So if I knew I had to be at a, a hotel in 70 miles and this guy stopped and it was getting you know dark and I wasn't there yet, I'd have to say, sorry, no. But since I didn't have a plan, I could say yes and, and know that that, that, was, that was part of the plan. And I said yes a lot. In fact, I stayed with 68 people, 68 families, excuse me, on my trip. And one of the things I'm most proud of in my book is that the acknowledgement is seven pages long. And it's so important to me to recognize that like my trip was solo. Like I, I rarely biked with other people. I was alone on my bike 99% of the time, but it was not a solo trip. Well, cause first I was with millions of monarchs and second, I was helped by thousands of people. And there were people that fed me and there were people that invited me into their house. There were people that, that gave me donations. There were people that came to my presentations that interviewed me for newspapers. And the only way my trip happened was because of thousands of people. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that I was able to give them, give them a shout out in one way or another in, in the acknowledgements. And um, I, I wanna talk on, with this photo, a one, more, one more note, which is that, well, I love this photo because it's another way that connected me to the monarchs, to the experience of their migration. Because in the foreground of this picture, this is Margaret. She's a dairy farmer in Canada. She is feeding me homemade chocolate ice cream, which is just like, that's ideal in my mind. And then of course, who in the background is she feeding? Pollinators, she's feeding the monarchs. And it was like this so often. I would get invited into someone's house and they would be feeding me 
And I'd look out the window and I'd be like, oh, they're also feeding the monarchs. And the monarchs and, and I relied on the exact same people in so many ways to make our trips possible. And it's, and it's so important that we have a big team because here's, here's the reality. This is a graph of the population and um, you don't need to know too much other than that this is the number or this is about the this is the area occupied by monarchs in their overwintering grounds so scientists don't count monarchs by going out and just going one two three because they would <laughs> that would be impossible what they do instead is they measure how many how much area of forest is occupied by monarchs each year and then on on this axis we have the the year and all wildlife populations fluctuate year to year that's totally normal what's not normal is this downward decline and down is dangerous down is is scary down can be depressing and we have to turn this around if we're going to save the migration and we we need everyone every single person matters and and not ev everyone is going to have the same role to play so some people are going to be planting gardens some are going to be sharing the story with kids at school some people are going to be rowling and in, in dc to get better legislation and and there's folks like me that are just trying to get the word out and i gave presentations during my trip i talked to about 9,000 people i presented at 49 schools and at 31 um, public venues like nature centers and this was the the core of my trip was to be a voice for the monarch and i i often called my trip a publicity stunt because i actually never helped monarchs right because what monarchs need our nectar plants and milkweed, they need a home. And I wasn't doing that by peddling. But what I was doing was making it fun to point out all the places where we can, we can return the prairie, return um, native habitat to native animals and plants. And, and so I was the publicity stunt, honestly, to, to, make, to make people aware. And that's what we need is people just need need to be aware they need to hear the story of the monarch and we need to be telling the story in all the ways we can because some people will read this book to get the story and some people will learn it other ways and that every every way is important and 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 i have to say that that part was was really important to me and it really helped helped cope with something i didn't know i was going to experience and and this this picture is, is the start of that story which is often I'd be biking down a road. This was in Indiana and I would be able to spot a caterpillar. There's a fifth instar caterpillar right here. And I'm biking down the road and I see this caterpillar and I'm like feeling pretty boastful about the fact that I can spot caterpillars while biking 10 miles an hour down the road. And I slam on my brakes as I always do, dump my bike on the ground because my bags are made out of kitty litter buckets. And I'm in the ditch searching around and I did this so many times. In fact, in Texas, the highway patrol showed up because people were were calling in a crashed cyclist. Um, people would stop and yell out the window, are you OK? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm looking for caterpillars. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, boy, and just race off. But I spent a lot of time on the ditch in ditches. And it was glorious. It was so fun. And then that said, I would come across this. And my heart would just break, just mile after mile, it would break, imagining all of the life that had just been mowed down. And it wasn't just these roadsides, which are actually can be really good habitat for monarchs. And actually there's a le legislation right now to provide funding to get more roadside habitat. Um, but it was every day, all day. I passed schools with these huge green grass lawns, houses, farmlands, like it was everywhere. It was all the time. and this part of the presentation isn't to shame people because I know what people are doing when they're planting this grass is they're trying to be a good neighbor. But a neighbor to who? This might make your human neighbors happy, but it's not helping any of our more than human neighbors. It's not helping the monarchs, it's not helping the birds, it's not helping the bees, it's not helping the Joe pieweed and the goldenrod. Like we have to start thinking about more than humans and we have to start sharing the planet. And the only way we're going to do this is to look around at the at the area where we live and say, where can I share? And I got angry, but luckily there were so many people that were already looking for ways to share, looking for places to share. And I would call these visits, I would call these 
these gardens my medicine. And this is a, a picture of me in a school garden in Omaha. And this was like the best medicine I could ask for. This garden was pretty small, but it used to just be grass in a parking area. And the teacher convinced the school to start a garden and we're here, some, some milkweed. And it was just like the most fun day to go into the yard and with all the kids, we were just so excited. And I will never ever forget the moment where a monarch just flew over our heads and all of us in unison just started like cheering on this butterfly. And I know that butterfly would not have been there without that garden. And I'm also, and I also know that that butterfly knew that garden was there and had, and, and can find it. So it's kind of mind blowing that a, a small butterfly can find your garden in the sea of pavement and grass, but they can. And, and so if you plant these gardens, you will f see monarchs eventually, or you'll definitely see butterflies of some sort or another. More medicine was with farmers. I met farmers doing things different. And this is Bill, he's a great example. He owns, or with his family owns Native American seed in Junction, Texas. And he started his career planting Bermuda grass uh, lawns for landscaping. And one day he was like, wait a second, I live in Texas. Why am I planting a grass that needs water and herbicides and fertilizer? Like this is, this is weird. And so he looked around and he said, all the native plants, they can, they're adapted to this Texas soil and this Texas weather or climate. So let's plant Texas natives. And he wanted to help others do that. So he started the farm and he, I visited their farm twice actually. And it was just so beautiful to see these rows and rows. I saw rows of milkweed, which was just so delightful. And they gather up the seeds and they sell the seeds and the seed packets um, to big to, to big operations and small. And they're really just like literally helping replant Texas, which is again, so beautiful and such good medicine. Uh, here's some more medicine. This is Amy's garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I love this garden because it's such a great example of sharing. So here we have some green grass and we have a patio and then we have some common milkweed in this little garden here. And for a lot of people, it might be like, oh, that's a small garden. It's not probably that helpful. Well, especially in in places like Oklahoma and Texas and, and even in, in Missouri too, these these early season gardens are just so crucial. And when I arrived in early, or maybe I wanna say mid-April, Amy had already found 40 egg, monarch eggs on her milkweed. And here's like the most beautiful thing. If only one of those eggs survives, that could mean 500 more eggs the next generation. And if only a few of those eggs survive, that could be thousands more eggs by the time they reach Canada. And what I love is that it's, it might be a long shot, but there's like this small chance that one of the eggs in Amy's garden survived. And one of you watching tonight either saw her butterfly, saw that butterfly or saw a generation removed from that butterfly, but like that you all are connected through this, this, this traveler, this migrant, this butterfly. And I, every time I see a butterfly, I think about that. I think who, who helped make this butterfly's life possible? Who also has seen this butterfly? And I, I get chills thinking about it because it's just, it's, it's such a gift that the monarch gives us. And then of course, I'm so excited to finally talk about this, this other medicine that I, I had. I, um, this is Nadia's garden in Columbia, Missouri. Woo woo, go Columbia. And Nadia invited me to stay at her house. And she probably just needed to give me the street because it was very, very obvious which house was hers. Because you go down the street and it's green grass, green grass, green grass, and then boom, this explosion of color and natives. And it was so fun to be there. And there were walking sticks that I'll never forget. And there were monarch caterpillars and there were monarch adults. And there were all these bugs that I don't even know their names, but they had a home because of Nadia. And what I love most about this picture is you can see where her property line is, but you can see there's this brave scouting milkweed in her neighbor's lawn. And I asked her about it and she said, well, the, mon the neighbors learned that without milkweed, there's no monarchs. It's a very simple equation, no milkweed, no monarchs. And so they started mowing around the milkweed. And I love this so much because Nadia's example is spreading just as the milkweed is spreading. 
And Nadia alone can't be the example for everyone, but if there is a person on every single uh, street that's being that example, well, then those will just slowly spread. And, and so I think Nadia is a great example of what that means to be an example and a, a pioneer for sure, and I'm super brave for doing that. And I also love that she's like, why do you stick to the backyard? Like this is, these plants are beautiful. We need to showcase them. So put them in the front yard. And I just, I hope Nadia's here tonight. I'm, I'm just so thrilled. Oh, they say, hi, hello. I'm, I'm so grateful for this day. And I, I stayed with another family in Colombia. Um, I remember um, Candy who went to my presentation. So she had a really amazing garden as well. And then I have one more little bit of medicine I wanted to share. Oh, but first I actually want to read about my stay with Nadia because it really was just this, ex this exceptional garden. And boy, howdy, I, sh I should have marked it better. So I will, I know I, here we go. Forgot I was gonna do this. Do, 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 do. Got a lot of chapters here. Sorry, someone should tell a, a quick, a quick uh, joke in the chat. Uh oh. Here we go. Here we go. Sorry about that. I'm obviously not a professional author yet, but now I got it. I even got it marked up. So this is um, a little bit about my stay with Nadia. Just a, foot, just a few feet from Nadia's mailbox, 10 mating pairs of walking sticks swung like trapeze artists from their actual stick homes. Below, a monarch caterpillar gorged. In the, state, in the space between, bees, wasps, and skippers delighted in the many meal offerings. Each and every animal I saw existed entirely because Nadia gave them space to live. Those animals owed their lives to her generosity, her commitment to nature, her stewardship, and her bravery for ignoring the pressure to have a typical green lawn. She invited us all to see a new way. She invited us to see our yards as something more. Beyond the property line, a few clumps of common milkweed stood in the neighbor's turf, out of place like brave scouts forging ahead to scan the horizon for hospitality. Nadia explained that her neighbor no longer mowed around the trespassing milkweed after learning that it was the monarch's only chance. Knowledge like rhizomes of persistent milkweed spread slowly but surely. That triumphant milkweed stood alone, doing its part, but it was not alone. Many of us were trying to spur action. My mission was to just be, was to be just such, my mission was to be just such a catalyst of change. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause because then the next part I talk about what I did after visiting Monarch, um, um, Nadia, and I should also say her husband, Randy, who's, I'm, I'm sure um, had to do a, a little bit of uh, gardening work from time to time as well. Um, but I visited this this garden, or not this garden, well, it is a garden. This was the University of Missouri's A.L. Gustin golf course. And I was invited to visit it. And I never thought on a bike tour to follow Monarchs, I would be excited to go to a golf course. But here I was. And I wanna actually just continue. I'm gonna skip a few paragraphs and read uh, one short little bit about this golf course. The unconventional golf course was nurturing not only native plants and pollinators, but stewardship in unlikely circles. Golfers came and saw a different kind of example. Many at first complained about the quote, weedy look, but Isaac, and, and Isaac is the grounds manager, was patient. He took the time to talk to each confused golfer, helping them understand and appreciate the native plants. Isaac was a voice for the monarchs, reaching people that I likely couldn't. Nadia talking to her neighbor, Isaac talking to golfers, every conversation adds up. No one can talk to everyone, but everyone can talk to someone. And that is, I think, the most beautiful part about all of the of monarch conservation. And this is a picture of the monarchs in Mexico. And when they fly, you can literally hear their wings beating. And one monarch alone is pretty much silent, but when thousands take to the sky, it is impossible to ignore. And it's the same with all of us. My voice alone is a, is a mere whisper, but all of us together, Isaac and Nadia and Margaret and all of the people that are out there, so many of them I'm sure are here tonight helping, like what our voices are adding up. And, and this, is, this is so important to remember when things feel impossible. 
And while we're talking about monarch metaphors, one monarch in the when they're clinging from the branches of the Oyamel fir trees in Mexico would maybe move a needle. But if you look in the deep in the background of this picture, this is a small tree, but it's still a tree nonetheless. And on the tree are thousands of monarchs and their collective weight are bending branches. And so one garden alone is just a garden, but all of the gardens, adding, they add up to something powerful and they add up to a solution. And we can metaphorically bend trees if we all just do a small bit, but, we'll do, but we do it together. And I just think that it's, that, that's hope. That's where hope lies. And it doesn't matter where you live. This is a monarch I saw in New York City. New York City, if, if monarchs can, can be happy in New York City, then they can be happy in your backyard. And and I want to, um, I'm, I'm a little talking a little too much right now, but I'll just run through one other lessons I think the monarchs give us, and and that's that the monarch is a teacher, and the monarch is an ambassador of nature. So it's so easy to fall in love with this beautiful butterfly, but if you listen to the monarch and you let the monarch kind of hold your hand and bring you back into nature you're gonna to start to find their caterpillars. And you're gonna say, oh, that's the cutest little caterpillar I ever saw. And then you're gonna to start to notice the tussock moths that also rely on milkweed. And you're gonna find the googly-eyed spiders that might munch a, a, a small monarch egg from time to time and are super cute. And you're gonna find other pollinators that are important, like this hummingbird moth, which blew my mind the first time I saw one. And you're gonna find even frogs and my, heart is dedicated to amphibians. I love amphibians with a strange passion. Um, and this little little froglet was seeking refuge in a common milkweed leaf. And so it doesn't matter what species that matters most to you. What matters most is that you're doing something to help. So if you help the frogs, you will be helping monarchs. And if you help the monarchs, you will be helping frogs. So if you love birds, Think about the birds. If you love bees, go help bees, but just pick something and help them and really everyone will be helped because of that. And, and you'll have an adventure. You'll find and you'll discover all these beautiful secrets that are in our own backyards. And so you don't have to brave the deserts of Mexico or try and navigate New York City or even, even fight off um, dangerous beasts on roadsides in Canada. By the way, the skunk and I were both okay. Scariest animal of the trip though. All you have to do to have an adventure with the monarchs is plant, plant a garden. And this is some, some milkweed I planted at my parents' house. It definitely died, but I learned a lot along the way. There, my dad right now has all these trays with little milkweed sprouts and he sends me pictures and it's pretty awesome. So we're, we're all learning, we're all in this together. And if you plant that garden, here, this is my favorite part. If you plant the garden, the real adventurers, the, the adventurers that don't need maps and compasses and computers and the internet and sleeping bags and tents, the real adventurers will come to you. And it is, of course, the monarchs. And so before I, I turn it over to questions, I would love to read the last two paragraphs of my acknowledgments, which is a funny thing to read, but boy, howdy maybe my favorite two paragraphs and certainly important to me. Thanks to everyone fighting in endlessly big and small ways on behalf of the monarchs and their neighbors. Our paths may not have crossed, but your efforts are seen, felt, and appreciated. Biking past an unmowed ditch or a lawn devoted to natives will always make me hoot with joy. And finally, with all my heart and soul, thanks to the monarchs, you amaze me. You have become my teachers, encouraging an adventure teaching me Spanish, watercolor, web design, video editing, photography, networking, public speaking, gardening, stewardship, science, and love. You help me write this book and every word of it is for you. So that's my book, Bicycling with Butterflies. I should note that, um, well, if you wanna learn more, um, the website is beyondabook.org because I hope you read books and then you go out and you crawl around the ditches. That's where the real learning is. And this is a, a watercolor painting I did on, from my trip. And I should, I should note that another thing the monarchs taught me was to do a better signature. Uh, my first signature looked terrible. And then it was like, oh, now you're signing books. You've got to like think about it. And I sent a, 
picture to, to my friends and my signature and they were all like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so now you can get, um, you can buy a book from uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation and we have little have stickers that go in the book and they have my new signature that's way more fancy and you can get a, a signed copy and support Monarch Prairie Foundation who made all this night possible. So I'm gonna actually switch my screen over and then we can get to some questions. So let's do this. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was, that was a great presentation. Um, it was fun seeing, you know, pictures from things I had read about the book and, um, you know, mentioning parts. I, I know when you and I met, I was putting it open to the page that mentions Nadia because I was so excited to see a, a mutual friend, <laughs> a mutual friend in the book. So we do have um, a number of questions coming in in, in both the chat and the Q&A section. Um, for, for everybody watching, if you have any questions, please put them there in the Q&A section. Or if you're watching on Facebook, I'll, I'll switch over and look at that one too to see if there are questions. But um, uh, let's see, let's start with... Um, but usually so the most I, common question is, I should just ahead. get the most common question out of the way. Out of the way now. Can I, can I buy too many books? The answer is no. Go for it. Buy one for your neighbor. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Spread the word. Get one for your neighbor. And then whenever your, your milkweed plants jump over to their yard, they'll be a little more exactly. forgiving. <laughs> awesome. Well, someone here asks, um, you know, there's a great presentation. How many miles did you try to cover each day? And it, you've mentioned it took eight months to, to cover that 10,201. <laughs> Thank you. I tried to go about 60 miles a day, but that was very much a flexible number. If I didn't have like, so what I would do is I would, the word would get out that I was kind of going in this general route. And then people would contact me and say, oh, can you come to my school? Or, oh, can you come to my nature center? And I'd look at my map and I'd get out my calculator and I'd either say, yeah, that's possible. Or that's possible if I bike really hard, but I can swing it or, that's not going to happen. You live thousands of miles away. And so then I would start to arrange presentations. And with schools, it was great because teachers didn't need to have a whole lot of notice. I could I could tell them three weeks or two weeks in advance I'd be there. And that was fine because their schedule was kind of similar. For for outdoor or for nature centers and, and presentations like that, I would have to be a little bit more on top of my game so that they would have time to advertise. But I would basically know, okay, I need to be in Columbia, Missouri on September 15th. I totally made that up. But then I'd say, okay, I've got 400 miles and I have eight days. Okay, I can go about 50 miles a day. And, and so I was, I was flexible, but I was always looking at, looking at my map to make a plan. That's great. And, and meeting people along the way, someone asked, how did these strangers know what you were doing, like to stop and visit with you? Like the man with the ice cream? A, a bike is a conversation starter. It's like if anyone has a little, a, a really cute dog and you walk down the street, people say, oh my gosh, your dog is so cute. Well, people would not say that about my bike, but they'd say, oh my gosh, where are you coming from? Where are you going? And I also on the back of my bike had a little sign that had my route because one thing I noticed is you can say, oh, I'm biking to Mexico. And they'd be like, okay. And then they look at a map and they're like, wait, 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 you're biking to Mexico? And so having a visual really helped and and then uh, and then so I would mostly just have people would just stop and start talking. That's great. Someone else had asked um, if you were did you get a lot of presentations when you were in Mexico? I gave a few presentations in Mexico. They were well in the beginning of my trip I didn't have a whole lot of stories because I'd only gone, you know, between Mitchell Con and the border was like almost exactly a thousand miles. And because I, I actually left later than I was expecting because I got this amazing invitation to plant beans at my friend Brianda's house. And I love beans. And she said, oh, we're gonna plant them. I, I think it was like March 11th. And I was like, oh, I have got to stay for that. So I like pushed my, I kept pushing back and so when I left, I left on March 12th I, from, from El Rosario. I started my trip earlier than that, but I left El Rosario on March 12th and the monarchs were like ahead of me. And so I just put my head down and I just, I tried, I got to the border in about two weeks and 
it, it hurt. I, my average speed for a lot of Mexico was like six miles an hour. So I was going more than 60 miles an hour, really, really slow every day. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> but I hope that I answered it. Presentations while you're in Mexico. But, um. Oh, right. I did actually see in the chat, how's my Spanish? It's way better. Um, I'm actually trying to write a book for, for kids about this journey. Originally, I I wanted the book to be for kids, but I just, I just realized as I was writing that I had things to say that were, I don't want to say darker, but they were just like, they were a, a little heavier than I'd want for a kid's book. And I don't want to say that my book is depressing. I think there's equal amounts of hope and fear in a lot of ways, but my kid's book, I've been getting feedback and the best joke that I have so far is how I explained to them how bad my Spanish was in the beginning. And I was at my friend Brianna's house, I've already talked about. And I, at the end of the dinner, I told them I wanted to do the dishes only. I didn't say I want to wash the dishes. I said, I want to wash, well, I got dishes and butts mixed up. Dishes is trastes and butts is traseros. And so I told them I want to wash the butts and they all looked at me like, <laughs> but luckily we were good friends. But so my Spanish is getting better, um, but I still make mistakes, but I'm totally willing to laugh at myself about them. That is great. That is great. Um, I had, there were some questions specifically about seeing monarchs. Someone was asking if you, if you saw them every day or were there areas where you didn't see them? And then were you actually keeping up with some monarchs on your trip? How did you know when and where they were? I, I relied on Journey North a lot to just kind of see where my progress matched theirs. And if you're not familiar with Journey North, North you should be. You can actually tr you can actually upload your sightings of monarchs, including the first sighting you see of the year. And so you can kind of, if you look at maps, it's really amazing because you the monarchs are like an organism and you can watch them spread out based on people's sightings. And you can see how it changes year to year. And I, and I was kind of using that, especially when I was, um, it, moving towards Texas, I could say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of behind, but, but as far as how many monarchs I saw, I actually, it's funny because I didn't see all that many monarchs and I saw 722 on my trip, adults, I saw way more caterpillars and eggs. And that's about two and a half monarchs a day. There were definitely times when I didn't see any, I, whenever there was a lot of corn and there wasn't habitat, I, I saw a lot of corn and not monarchs. When I was in Missouri, I was it was on the fall migration. And in the fall, the monarchs will start clustering together at night. Um, and so one day I was, I think I was on the Katy trailer really close to it. And I see one monarch and I stop and I mark in my notebook because I had a little notebook, I'd keep track of all of them. And then I kept going and I saw another. And at first I was like, oh, that's the same one, just kind of like, you know, circling around. And then I saw another and I saw another. And I think in like the course of a half an hour, I saw probably 80, which was the, the most I saw it at any concentrated amount of time. And I believe what was happening, it was early in the morning. And so they had just kind of left their roost all together and they were kind of just splitting up for the day, which was exciting. But a quick, a little quick story. Uh, the next, that my trip was in 2017 and in 2019, I, I led a bike tour across the country. And in Texas, I, I say in a course of two days, I saw 10,000 monarchs. And the whole time I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I rode my bike for almost nine months and saw less than a thousand and here I am. And then I saw 10,000, but it was equally as glorious. And, and the other thing I say is it, I didn't see a monarch every day, but every day I saw the people that can take care of the monarch. And that was more important to me in a lot of ways than, than being exactly on time with monarchs. Yes, thank you. And um, speaking of seeing, monarchs from your bike someone's asking um for you to describe the picture on the wall behind you there's a couple pictures yes. behind you. <laughs> well I'm in this in a lodge and all of the other window or all the other walls have windows and this is the dry erase board and it's super shiny so I put up two two watercolor paintings I did and this one it's kind of impossible to tell what it is but it's an aerial or like a bird's eye view of me on my bike so that's my helmet my water bottle my panniers and these are my arms and I'm, it's a self-portrait of me flying with the monarchs. And I didn't exactly see this picture, but in, in Mexico on the first day, I was biking in a river of, of butterflies and it, it felt an awful lot like this. And then this is just, 
uh, an experiment that kind of failed with the background. I don't like the the blue, but it's it's nicer than a board. And on on my trip, I would I would like to. I stayed with so many people, and I wanted to to give them thank yous. And so I would. It's like, what do you? You're on a bike. You can't carry a lot of things, and you can't really plan to have something ready. But so what I did is I carried small bits of watercolor paper and at night it kind of de decompressed when I was camping by myself I would draw scenes from my trip and I would actually give them to 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 people in order to say thanks and so the monarchs I said in the acknowledgments the monarchs taught me to watercolor and and when I mean that what I mean by that is they were the excuse I needed to keep practicing and I wanted to do better and I because I wanted to get it right because I wanted to do them justice and so I kept practicing and practicing and in that way that's the same with the book is without the monarchs I would not have written a book and I'm just I'm so grateful for them for kind of pushing me to 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 do these things great great thank you um someone here asked other than milkweed and we know the importance of milkweed for monarch caterpillars. Um, what was the nectar plants that you saw a lot of migratory adult monarchs feeding on? It varied from season to season and location to location. But when I, by the time I got to Missouri in the fall, my favorite plant of all time and the plant I was seeing the most was goldenrod. I, you would just, and goldenrod, a lot of people think they're like scared of it because they think it's ragweed and will give you lots of allergies. It's not, it's just the most beautiful plant. In fact, my favorite sentence in the entire book that when I gave it to the copy editor, I said, this is the only sentence that I can't part with, which as an author or as a writer, you're supposed to be able to part with those, but no, I said no to this one was um, that I've never met a lonely goldenrod. And it is the truth. You go to a, you go up to a goldenrod, whenever, wherever, and it will just be thick with pollinators, bees, butterflies, every, you name it. And it's just such a beautiful plant. And shout out to the goldenrod. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So there's another native plant for you all to add to your gardens, along with your milkweed. So um, someone asked here, and I'm now kind of curious too. Do you know what about the average speed of a monarch would be if you're trying to cycle with them? It really depends on the wind in so many cases. I, when I was in the, with the monarchs in Mexico, our pace, I was going a little downhill, but on a rocky road. So I wasn't like pedaling super hard. And our pace really did match at about probably 12 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. Sometimes they'd go way, way past me. I, and then often they would go higher into the sky and they would catch wind and then they'd go way faster than me. And other times they'd be fighting the wind down low, trying to find nectar plants and I could, I could pass them. So it, it, it ranges um, really based on conditions. Got it, what a fun race. Um, I should say though, I have to pause here. I forgot this is a, <laughs> was a perfect segue for a, a joke that I missed the opportunity for is- Go for it. Um, I was, I do actually think that I am slower than a butterfly, but faster than a caterpillar. So <laughs> there you go. There I you go. That's, funny. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a good speed for bikes. Yeah. Speaking of the jokes, there was, when you asked for one earlier, James had started, he said three monarchs walk into a bar, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. If he has a punchline for that joke, I, I invite him to put it in the comment section. Um, Please. Someone was asking, you know, you mentioned your future children's book. Um, are you planning for that to be in Spanish? I would love for any and every book I ever write to be in Spanish. I, my Spanish is passable, but it is not at a place where I could okay, translate, translate a book that is kind of a little bit of a little, a little more poetic um into into spanish so my my fingers are crossed that my adult book will be translated into spanish and i think a kid's book would be even better i'm, I'm hoping that it's a like a chapter book for my favorite audience to talk to in my presentations was like the the eight to 12 year old range i liked that age because they knew they had a, they knew there was a future they knew there was something beyond them but they hadn't decided how they thought about the world or how they think about the world still they're they're still they're still ready to be amazed and and so i would really like my book to to be to them and i would i would love it to be in spanish that's awesome that's awesome 
All right, let me um, let me see what other questions we have popping up. Someone's um, someone had asked on on this trip. I mean, traveling across so many countries. Did you ever did you ever feel unsafe biking or, or camping? There were moments, but they were usually fleeting. And you know, at night, people are always so worried about my camping, but I honestly felt safe almost every night. And it was often because I was hidden. Like no one in the in the no one in the world would <laughs> would know that I was there, and and so I did feel I feel I felt really safe. I'm also I think a a pretty good judge of character. I think by the by the time you've accepted invitations and stayed with oh I don't know I've I've probably stayed with 400 strangers, like in different houses over the course of my travels. You pick up pretty quickly whether or not that that's someone you want to go with. And, and sometimes I'm a little wrong, but I'm, I feel, I feel confident in myself and my abilities. And, and that's, that was enough for me. Great. Um, well, since you, you had mentioned that one picture of, of milkweed that you had, uh, you didn't think it survived. So are, do you consider yourself much of a gardener? Can you give tips um, for people that are wanting to plant milkweed? my my tip to people is just have have fun and don't be discouraged and plant a lot of different things and the plants that want to live in your soil with your sunlight with your amount of water they'll let you know which ones that will that is and i tell i tell folks like start small like you don't have to dig up everything the first year but i think one of the things i think we need to do with the monarchs and i think this is happening in a lot of places is is build in these these celebrations in our society to, to celebrate the things like the return of the monarch to celebrate the, the creatures in our neighborhoods. And, and so I think a great way to celebrate the return of the monarch every year is to expand your garden plant plant a few plants every year as a way to say like, yay, like we've done this, we did another year, the monarchs have returned. I'm not, a, I don't have a green thumb. But you know, that's why everyone has their role to play. And if if that's not your role, you can be the person that's that's taking kids on field trips or you know find, finding another way to, to to be part of the solution. Yes, yes, perfect. And and, um, and maybe and, you, Brooke, maybe you have a an answer to that that's that's more helpful. And and that's <laughs> what I'll say. Know, are I'll, you a, yeah, go ahead. Well, I for working for a plant organization, I actually have what I call a brown thumb or black thumb or just not green. Um, I don't have too much luck with plants, but I'll send out some information tomorrow about milkweeds that are being native here to the to the lower Midwest um, that'll be best for monarchs and, and links to, we have this native plant database that you can search for things, um, different native plants based on, you know, if you have a sunny yard, dry yard, what your soil is like etc. Um, and it'll, it'll pull up things and it'll mention if there's a benefit for different pollinators. So I'll send all of those resources out to everybody tomorrow along with the, the recording here. So, um, so all of you that are wanting to get native plants, I'll hand you information on different plant sales going on around the state of Missouri and um, other ways that you can get some native plants and learn how to put them in the ground to where they'll be successful which is something I'm still working on, so. Um, it's a process, but, it's all part of the adventure. Yes, the other yes. thing is like native plants, they are adapted to like a, na a Missouri native is adapted to Missouri's climate and soil often. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes we're more scared than we need to be. And if we just start, starting is always the hardest part. Like of my trip, starting was the hardest. All my adventures starting is the hardest. So I, I think honestly with even gardening, the hardest part is just deciding to go do it and making it happen. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, I see there's um, one or two questions about other presentations. So I'll just say, Diane and whoever else sent that message, if you, if you email me back or respond back to that email tomorrow, I can put you in contact with Sarah if you're interested in hosting some of these presentations. She's been, well, she gave one up. Iowa yesterday. She has one with a big national group tomorrow. She was talking to Kansas the other weekend. So this uh, this virtual format has gotten you around the country giving these presentations. So yeah, is, for sure. This is great. Well, I, I think we covered um, most of the questions. So um, was there another heavy hitter question that you usually get asked a lot um, that you want to share? 
<laughs> share something or share some insight with us before we go? I, I think the most of the, you know, kids' questions are always a little different. One of my favorite questions a kid ever asked was, she came up to me after a presentation and I was putting away all my stuff. And then she just looked at me and she goes, is any of this real? <laughs> and that was just my hands down my favorite question. And it is real, like this, like I am a normal person. I am not super strong or super extra brave or any of that like I just had this idea and went with it and I think all of us can can be more more ready to step into these roles and like just just go for it because you, you don't know where it will take you but it, it's going to take you someplace fun and exciting and I, I can't believe I'm I'm here I can't believe I wrote a book and it's just it's a, it's a thrill this is awesome this is awesome well Thank you for everything you're doing to champion monarchs. And that's what I'll send some resources tomorrow to where all of you can become champions for monarchs through native plants and other ways to, to support um, these flies and caterpillars and the native plants and habitats they need. So Sarah, thank you for joining us for this presentation. Um, it was just fantastic. And folks, if you want more, get the book. Um, I, I <laughs> got to read it. It was fantastic. Um, I'm excited to be sharing my, my copy with friends and getting more copies uh, to share with people so they can read about this adventure too. So I'll, I'll share that link tomorrow in that email as well to where you can order it and it'll come with a, that signed little, little book plate. So thank you, Sarah. This was, this was fantastic. Yes. And we hope to hop on on some other presentations you're going to be doing. And whenever it's safe again, we'll be excited to host you here in Missouri. Awesome. I can't wait. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Missouri. <laughs> and thank you, Missouri Prairie Foundation. You guys are doing awesome work. Keep it up. We're in this together. So yes, I, indeed, I appreciate indeed. all the all the great thanks and all the well wishes. And yes, it's it's awesome to be part of this team. So thanks. Yes, you have you have lots of love in this in this chat section right now I so know. the mo the, mo the more i help the monarchs the more the monarchs help me and it's just so reciprocal and wonderful and yes so that's thank you so that's much fantastic awesome well great well have a good evening and um or afternoon where you are yeah. and everyone here in missouri have a good evening and we'll we'll see you on another webinar soon <laughs> awesome thank you